The mediastinum extends from the thoracic inlet to the diaphragm, and it's often subdivided into three compartments, the anterior mediastinum, the middle mediastinum, and the posterior mediastinum. As chest radiologists, we typically use the anterior surface of the great vessels and heart as the boundary between the anterior and middle mediastinum. And often we use the anterior surface of the thoracic spine as the boundary between the middle mediastinum and posterior mediastinum. The posterior mediastinum is a topic of this talk, and we'll be primarily focusing on posterior mediastinal masses. There's basically only two organs in the posterior mediastinum the spinal cord and its spinal nerves, and the thoracic spine. Posterior mediastinal masses are therefore usually either neurogenic or vertebral. Neurogenic posterior masses are more common, and that's where we'll begin. As a chest radiologist, you'll see my approach to neuroanatomy is quite basic. There's the spinal cord. Um, there are spinal nerves coming off of the spinal cord at every vertebral level, and each spinal nerve is enveloped by a nerve sheaf, which I've chosen to draw, draw in brown here. The spinal cord and the roots of the spinal nerves are enveloped by a CSF-filled fecal sac, which I've drawn in light blue, and we have sympathetic chains running parallel to the spinal cord on both sides. For the most part, we don't encounter posterior mediastinal masses of spinal origin, spinal cord origin, but we do encounter ones of spinal nerve and nerve sheaf origin, ones of sympathetic chain origin, and ones of fecal sac origin. And both uh, benign and malignant um, versions can occur. Um, benign neurogenic posterior mediastinal masses arising from the spinal nerves and nerve sheaths uh, include neurofibromas and schwannomas. Uh, ganglioneuromas can, may arise from the sympathetic chain, and meningocele and myelomeningocele can arise from the fecal sac. Malignant neurogenic uh, posterior mediastinal masses arising from the, um, the spinal nerves and nerve sheaths include malignant neurofibromas and malignant nerve sheaf tumors. In the adult population, we're generally reading uh, neuroblastomas, a malignant um, neurogenic tumor of sympathetic chain origin are pretty uncommon. And I don't know of any um, malignant tumors of fecal sac origin. So when I think of the differential for neurogenic posterior mediastinal masses, this is what I think of. I think of neuro neurofibromas and schwannomas, I think of malignant neurofibromas and nerve and malignant nerve sheath tumors. I think of ganglion neuromas, and I think of meningocele and myelomeningocele. Fortunately, the majority of neurogenic tumors in the posterior mediastinum are benign. Let's start with the first of these, and we're going to talk about neurofibromas and schwannomas together. Um, they share a lot of um, characteristics. Both neurofibromas and schwannomas are slow-growing and they can grow from any part of the peripheral nerve. Um, the ones that happen near the root become posterior mediastinal masses when they um, become large enough, uh, whereas the ones that are a little bit more peripheral uh, next to the rib uh, may evolve into a chest wall mass instead. Neurofibromas and schwannomas are usually asymptomatic and tend to be incidentally discovered in um, early adulthood. Those are the um, features that neurofibromas and schwannomas share, but there's a few special things to, to um, kind of mention when it comes to neurofibromas in particular, uh, particularly uh, in the setting of um, neurofibromatosis, where there are multiple neurofibromas. With um, these kind of um, patients, um, you might see infiltration um, along entire nerve trunks or the plexus resulting in what's referred to as a plexiform uh, neurofibromatosis or plexiform neurofibroma, um, and uh, malignant gender degeneration um, can occur, though is uncommon. The imaging features of neurofibromas and schwannomas on CT are uh, very similar. Um, either may present as solid or quote-unquote cystic pairing masses on CT. They appear cystic because the presence of myelin 
uh, will result in a lower average um, attenuation value when you draw an ROI on the mass. They're usually round or oval in shape, but can be dumbbell shaped when they're crossing the neuroforamina. Neurofibromas and schwannomas are usually well circumscribed on CT and unilateral. And they're usually not associated with invasion or destruction of the adjacent uh, bones. This is a nice example of a schwannoma presenting as a posterior mediastinal mass. It's oval, well circumscribed, it's unilateral. Here's an example of a neurofibroma presenting on a chest x-ray. We can see it on the frontal chest x-ray, probably a little bit better than we can see it on the lateral. Um, we can see it a lot better on the coronal MPRs from the patient's um, chest CT. And we can see how this is a mass of the posterior mediastinum, which appears to be crossing um, a neuroforamen um, that is also uh, well circumscribed. The um, MR images really kind of um, help illustrate what we're dealing with, uh, a dumbbell-shaped mass well circumscribed, uh, resulting in a posterior mediastinal um, mass. Um, so these are the um, typical imaging features of a neurofibroma or a schwannoma. Plexiform uh, neurofibromas um, are a little different um, because they're, first of all, large, um, but they tend to be uh, more infiltrative of surrounding tissues, and their margins may be more indistinct. We talked about how um, there are benign tumors of um, peripheral nerve or nerve sheaf origin, but there are also malignant ones too, malignant neurofibromas and malignant nerve sheaf tumors. On CT imaging, um, these malignant versions of these um, tumors uh, share many of the same features as the benign version. However, um, what distinguishes them from the uh, benign neurofibromas and schwannomas um, are that malignant neurofibromas and malignant nerve sheath tumors uh, tend to be larger and usually invade um, adjacent structures. Fortunately, malignant neurofibromas and malignant nerve sheath tumors are rare, um, but um, not surprisingly, they can arise from any part or they um, arise from a pre-existing neurofibroma or schwannoma and can grow from any part, therefore, of the peripheral nerve because that's where neurofibromas and schwannomas also can arise from. So um, malignant neurofibromas and malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors can present as both posterior mediastinal masses or chest wall masses too. Ganglioneuromas are benign neurogenic tumors of sympathetic chain origin. Um, they're slow growing, often incidentally discovered in early adulthood, and some patients are asymptomatic, but some are not. Ganglioneuromas are usually unilateral when they present an imaging and often have a more spindle or elongated shape, uh, longitudinally oriented in the posterior mediastinum spanning several vertebral body levels, like this one in the lower um, left chest. Um, on the CT um, MP, um, kernel MPR, you can see this um, um, well-circumscribed posterior mediastinal mass that is relatively spindle-shaped in origin. Meningocils and myelomeningocils are relatively uncommon. They represent uh, herniated lepto meninges. They are usually asymptomatic and incidentally discovered. The imaging features of a meningocil or a myelomeningocil on CT are pretty much the same imaging features that we described for a neurofibroma or schwannoma. So if you're looking at a CT of a posterior mediastinal mass, um, Meningocils and myelomeningocils are pretty much indistinguishable from neurofibromas and schwannomas. Um, obviously, you may have a better shot at distinguishing the two um, on MRI, though. Let's move on to vertebral posterior mediastinal masses. When it comes to vertebral posterior mediastinal masses, um, our differential diagnosis um, includes bulky osteophytes. Sometimes they can look quite mass-like. They include, um, our differential will also include paraspinal abscesses, usually in the setting of vertebral osteomyelitis, in addition to other things like paraspinal hematomas, the occasional neoplasm, and the rare extramedullary hematopoiesis cases. Let's start with bulky osteophytes. Um, sometimes osteophytes can get quite bulky and mass-like. Um, however, fortunately, um, they're almost always diagnostic on CT. Bulky osteophytes are either unilateral or bilateral in the presentation, and they are 
because they're osteophytes usually centered upon the intervertebral disc base level. So if we see a um, posterior mediastinal mass on, say, uh, lateral chest x-ray that looks like it's centered on the intervertebral disc disc level, we're going to have a high suspicion that that might be a bulky osteophyte once we get the CT. Paraspinal abscesses are another um, vertebral posterior mesonal mass that we may encounter in folks with vertebral osteomyelitis. Um, These could be due to all sorts of different organisms from both local and distant sources. People with uh, paraspinal abscesses in the setting of vertebral osteomyelitis usually have um, some underlying risk factors or comorbidities. Um, IV drug use, diabetes, cancer are some of the common ones we think about. And they generally present more commonly in the lumbar spine. So I admit you'll probably encounter more paraspinal abscesses um, in abdominal imaging than perhaps chest imaging. The imaging features of paraspinal abscess um, in the setting of vertebral osteomyelitis um, will obviously include some of the typical imaging features we expect in vertebral osteomyelitis, such as narrowing of an intervertebral disc space and erosion of the adjacent end plates. The abscess itself may present as either thickening or um, a clear abscess when we look at imaging. And abscesses are usually bilateral in their distribution. The traditional teaching or the classic teaching has been that bacterial cases involve one disc space, whereas tubercular cases involve two or more. This is an example of patient uh, we had with uh, paraspinal abscess. And on the frontal chest x-ray, you can see how the paraspinal lines are displaced laterally on both the right and left side of the lower thoracic spine. On the lateral um, chest x-ray, you might not perceive um, a paraspinal mass per se, but we can certainly see how the um, superior and inferior end plates adjacent to one of these lower intervertebral disc spaces does look kind of eroded, even though the disc space still looks intact at this stage or in terms of its height. The CT images of this patient reveal a posterior mediastinal mass surrounding the lower thoracic spine and even some bone um, destruction on this particular image. And these are the corresponding sagittal um, MRI images of this patient. Paraspinal hematomas are another vertebral posterior mediastinal mass um, that we'll encounter perhaps in the setting of trauma in a patient who has some sort of fracture involving the vertebral um, body or bodies. Paraspinal hematomas are usually bilateral in their distribution. Here's an example of a patient with a posterior mediastinal mass Um, caused by a paraspinal hematoma. Uh, We can see how the right and left paraspinal lines are displaced laterally in the upper to mid chest on this particular chest x-ray. Neoplasms can be another potential vertebral posterior mediastinal mass. And when we think of neoplasms, we generally tend to think of lymphoma, primary bone tumors, and metastases. Of these three, um, lymphoma is by far and away the most common of the three things here to cause a posterior mediastinal mass. Uh, That's because that although metastases are very common um, in the spine, they rarely cause a posterior mediastinal mass. And also because primary bone tumors, especially of the thoracic spine, are just quite rare. The imaging features of lymphoma when it occurs um, in the posterior mediastinum is usually a soft tissue um, kind of mass that looks draped over the vertebral bodies. Lymphoma in the posterior mediastinum can be either bilateral or unilateral in its presentation, and it tends to respect the bone that's adjacent. Primary bone tumors, um, if we see them, uh, may be associated with many of the typical imaging features we are familiar with, with different types of primary bone tumors, from ABCs to, say, things like osteosarcomas. However, they're, they're quite rare, and I really can't remember the last time I encountered a primary bone tumor as a source of a posterior mediastinal mass. So I'll have to show you this example of a lymphoma presenting as a unilateral posterior mediastinal mass. And you can see on the bone windows that the underlying uh, vertebral bodies are intact. Finally, extramedullary hematopoiesis is another potential explanation for a vertebral posterior mediastinal mass. Extramedullary hematopoiesis um, 
um, has been described in the setting of chronic anemias and represents a compensatory mechanism for folks who cannot produce enough red blood cells from their normal marrow. So blood forming elements develop outside the bone marrow, often in the spleen and liver, but sometimes in the posterior mediastinum too. The imaging features of extramedullary hematopoiesis are multiple bilateral posterior mediastinal masses. These are usually of uniform attenuation and just distributed longitudinally um, along the spine. Um, it's quite uncommon to encounter a solitary extramedullary hematopoiesis mass. When I think of extramedullary hematopoiesis, I kind of think of this particular image. This is a chest x-ray we have, and on the frontal image, you can see these masses on both sides of the spine, and the lateral shows that they are posterior mediastinal in location. So let's put everything that we've discussed so far together. We know that some posterior mediastinal masses can be neurogenic in nature, and then there are some that may be vertebral in nature. The most common culprits are going to be things like bulky osteophytes, lymphoma, and benign neurofibromas and schwannomas. The most common um, neurogenic mass is the neurofibroma and schwannoma. The most common vertebral mass happens to be a bulky osteophyte, and the most common tumor um, that's of vertebral nature happens to be lymphoma. So this influences the way we build our workflow for how to approach the interpretation of a posterior mediastinal mass when we see one. And I'll walk you through this table. So if I see a posterior mediastinal mass, the first thing I'm going to ask myself is, am I just being fooled by a bulky osteophyte? Because they're quite common. If um, what I'm dealing with is not a bulky osteophyte, I'm going to ask myself next, is this a bilateral or a unilateral posterior mediastinal mass? If this posterior mediastinal mass is bilateral, um, I'm going to be looking at the adjacent bone. If the adjacent bone is not intact, there's a good chance I'm dealing with a paraspinal hematoma in the setting of trauma or a paraspinal abscess in the setting of vertebral osteomyelitis. And I'll probably be looking for other signs to reinforce that diagnosis. If, however, the bone looks intact and I'm looking at a bilaterally presenting posterior mediastinal mass, my first guess is going to have to be lymphoma. Um, are there other things that can look like this? Sure. Um, extramedullary hematopoiesis can present as a bilateral posterior mediastinal mass with intact bone, but that's just a such that's such a much more uncommon diagnosis than lymphoma. If um, the posterior mediastinal mass I'm looking at is unilateral in its distribution, I'm going to try to look at its morphology. If morphologically it looks like a neurofibroma or schwannoma, that's going to be probably the differential diagnosis I'm going to go with. Um, could a meningocil or a myelomeningocil look like a unilateral posterior mediastinal mass? Of course it could, but these, those just tend to be a lot more uncommon than neurofibromas and schwannomas. If the morphology just doesn't look quite right for a neurofibroma or schwannoma, I'm going to be thinking of something else. And my number one answer is going to be a unilaterally presenting case of lymphoma in the posterior mediastinum. Again, are there other things that could present this way? I'm sure ganglion neuromas could, for example. But lymphoma is just much, much more common than the other diagnoses that I have in dark gray here.